welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. I'm Julia Patrick. I'm so thrilled when I get the chance to talk with one of our faves, Katie Warnick, CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh. You know, I love it when we get to talk because you always rattle my cage a little bit and I feel like you give me a glimpse into what's going to be coming across the nation. Mm -hmm. You're being based in New York. I think you see a lot of things first as it goes across um, our, con you know, our country to see and learn and observe. But today it's going to be a little different because even though we're in summertime, just barely, we're talking about fall. So like I said, Katie, you're rattling my cage, friend. Let's chat. Okay, let's do it. Well, again, Katie Warnick, founder of Staffing Boutique, here talking today about temp strategies. Another strategy we like to always include is the strategy of all of our presenting sponsors who are here with us day in and day out to help us with the nonprofit show so that we can be talking to nonprofits really across the globe. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, where Katie joins us from, your part-time controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These folks join us day in and day out. Another new thing that we've started recently, and I hope you've had a chance to get to meet them and, and uh, learn from them, is our amazing co-host panel. They come from across the U.S. They're extremely diverse. They work in different parts of the nonprofit sector. And they are brilliant. It is so much fun building our team out with these amazing voices. And uh, although I get Katie all to myself today, so I'm just saying. Katie Warnick, CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique. Katie, can you back up a little bit before we get into this conversation and talk to us about your journey in working in this very specific part of the nonprofit sector, because you do something that is very unique. Yeah, sure. So I've been doing staffing for nonprofits since 2020, no, 2005, right when I graduated college. So I've, this is basically the only sector I know. Um, I love the nonprofit sector. I love doing staffing for it. So essentially I've paved my way making a business out of doing temp and temp to perm recruitment for the sector, specifically within assistant to mid-level manager roles. So really anything under that 90, 95 grand a year salary here in the New York area. So I do temp and temp to perm placement, and that's what I do. Uh, so a lot of development searches, development assistant, associate grant writer, events coordinators, basically program assistants, grants managers, grants assistants, anything within foundations, anything within higher ed, um, kind of across the board. I've been doing this for a long time. I started my own company in 2011. I truly do run and operate this ship every day. You know, I know every single search we have going on. I know every single <laughs> client. I pretty much know every candidate. My recruiters handle more of the candidate interaction, but I am on LinkedIn messaging people all day long, building my network. Um, I bust my butt over here, but I, I love what I do. It's really fun. You know, I love your i love your passion of course and i and i think your journey is so interesting because i have a suspicion that a lot of folks don't even understand that this is part of the labor market that this couldn't even exist for nonprofits. and so i'm fascinated you talked about grant writers data entry executive assistants i mean event coordination mm -hmm. special events it is remarkable uh, the diverse skill set that your sets that you're working with. Yeah, well, I think that there's a couple of things based on what I said, right? Like for me, I didn't know that the nonprofit sector was even an industry or a sector before I started recruiting for it in 2005. Like I didn't know philanthropy was a thing. When, yeah. Whenever I hashtag, I hashtag fundraising as a profession because I have to assume that many people don't understand that. You know, you hear about fundraisers, you hear about giving, you hear about philanthropy, but you don't understand that people are making a living in this sector. And it's a huge, huge sector. 
Um, so that, you know, I love to talk about what I do. I am literally a professional networker because there's always someone that works at a nonprofit or knows someone who's on the board or something like that. So that's mm -hmm. like a key piece of what I said and what I do and what I love about my job. This mm -hmm. piece is, you know, staffing, headhunting, whatever you want to call it is obviously an amazing industry in a in and of itself, but then for me to specifically be recruiting for only nonprofits and education organizations is sort of its own little niche, right? So mm -hmm. that's all I do. Um, there are a number of staffing firms that have a nonprofit component or a nonprofit arm, but literally it's all we do. Um, mm -hmm. So we've put all our eggs in this basket and it's it's been fun and, you know, here we are, what, 14 years later. <laughs> Make, so let, let me ask you one more question because you said something fascinating and I totally concur. And that is people don't think of the nonprofit sector as a viable economic engine mm -hmm. and a profession, you know, across the board, no matter what it is you're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that change? I mean, have you in your, in your tenure of 14 years, are you seeing people say, Oh yeah, that's, that's a viable career path. I think that there is, more awareness about um, nonprofits and fundraising from social media. And everybody is posting, you know, their golf outings or their their marathons and that sort of thing. So I think that there is more awareness as the social aspect of philanthropy and fundraising. I still don't think that people understand the work force behind that. Like you said, I, I still don't, you know, there's so many conversations that I have at the sauna, at the gym or wherever I am. And people are like, wow, that's, that's an industry. Tell me more. You know, when I say that I do, they're like, oh, you're like a headhunter. And I'm like, well, I own a, a temp agency. They're like, so you do like warehouse stuff. And I'm like, well, no, I do the actual people that work in nonprofits. And then it's like, oh, like, what's that? Like admin assistants. I'm like, well, well that, but the grant writers, the people that are throwing those events, like Kind of, they're like, oh, so you mean like the cocktail people at the event? And I'm like, no, the actual <laughs> people that plan the whole event, that pick the venue, that do the fundraising, you know, like the soup to nets person, that's who I please. And so, no, I don't think that people realize. You know, what you just said is really shocking. Um, and yet... I, I think you're right. I think you're right. We don't know. And it's it's so disturbing because it's almost like if you're not in the swim of philanthropy in the nonprofit world, how are you going to learn this? Yeah. Right. I mean, how how do you know if you haven't volunteered, if you haven't served, if you haven't attended events? That which, are I think, which I think is most people, right? Like I was definitely that person, you know, I was able to graduate college and still not know what a nonprofit was or, or what the industry was. And then it wasn't until I took my you know second job at a college that I understood what it was. You know, I look back after I learned about philanthropy and all those things and in-kind donations. And I remember, you know, like raising money in eighth grade for things and my father writing checks and that sort of thing. But I didn't realize what was actually going on sort of the transactional piece the the tax implications all of those other things that go around the nonprofit i didn't know any of that i will say that recent college grads who have like telethon experience and those sorts of skill sets or um you know volunteering have a huge you know advantage when they're if they want to work in the sector but they're really the only people i could say that know what the nonprofit se sector is when they're coming out of college. Yeah. Well, I think the Greek system, I think a lot of professional, mm -hmm. um, you know, collegiate professional organizations where they try and get kids networked into other groups and stuff, you mm -hmm. know, that, that they get engaged. But I, I agree with you. It, there is not enough engagement. And so it's a fascinating conversation because if we don't get kids not only educated, about how to to run and operate a nonprofit, um, but even just the concept of it, mm -hmm. uh, it takes decades for those folks to get in in groove and, and get in alignment so that mm -hmm. they can be participating. Um, so anyway, fascinating fascinating way to get into this conversation. But I have so many questions for you, Katie Warnick. So first thing 
I always like to do when we have you on mm -hmm. is I want you to kind of tell us, if you will, what's the current status of the labor market? I mean, when we talked to you over five years, it's been like, holy crap, keep your job because the job markets, there's yeah. nothing out there. And then it's holy crap, there's tons of jobs. And then, you know, it's it's just been such a roller coaster yeah. because of COVID and because of our economy. What are you seeing now? I got to be honest. I think that the past few times I've been on in 2024, I've pretty much said the same thing. I think we're very steady. I think that a lot of organizations are holding steady. I think that the election year is going to be a big indicator about where our sector goes. Um, so I think a lot of people are just holding steady in terms of the status of the labor market. We're still seeing the same thing. You know, there are jobs out there. People are looking for jobs. Um, candidates are looking for jobs, but it's a big um, pressure to find jobs that accommodate a candidate's lifestyle. So, you know, work from home, um, flexible benefits, whatever that might be, is really the driving force and when candidates are looking for new jobs. So we're holding steady. Um, unemployment rates are down um, and there are jobs out there. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is kind of like one of those um, freak out points where we use the word hold steady, but organizations are like, we don't know what's going to happen because of the general election and things are a little dicey and then boom, you know, second week of November things will move forward or do you have a sense of that? It's, it's weird because I'm saying that, right? Like it's, this is me saying, I think that everybody is kind of, you know, hold like just waiting to see what happens, but no one is really projecting what will happen either way. Right. So yeah, I right. think that that's sort of where we're at. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the election. I don't, I don't yeah. know which way the economy is going to rebound and what that effect mm -hmm. on the labor market is going to be. And regardless, mm -hmm. Even if something were to happen that was drastic, you know, nonprofits don't really feel that until probably nine months later because we're all most of us are running on fiscal years. So, you know, budgets are done. Right. So we'll see. So, you know, the okay. nonprofit sector feels a little bit later than the financial markets and the housing markets. Well, you mentioned something um, as we started this conversation about the flexibility. And I really want to talk about temp labor, you know, working on site versus working from home and and then we have WHA working happy anywhere, basically, you know, you could be literally in, you know, Antarctica or whatever. What are you seeing? And when you have candidates, um, are they saying, Katie, I don't want, I only want to work from home or what is that labor market looking like in terms of that? I love that you use the word flexibility. Yeah. I mean, I gotta be honest. Most people want to work from home. Um, I would say that the people that want to go into an office typically do have kids or they have another partner at home and they want to get out of the house or they want the option to. Um, so I would say if I was to give you percentages, about 40% of people want to work from home. I would say about 40% of people want the hybrid schedule and then about 20% of people really don't care. You know, some people just like to go to an office every day. I, I feel like they might like the structure or whatever that yeah. social interaction. Um, but but it's definitely the first question. You know, we're working on uh, it's kind of a unique search at a school right now. And, you know, it's it's finance and it's operations. And there's a little bit of um, community outreach to it. So it's very much a job where the person needs to be there. Higher level search. And we're struggling to find someone who wants to do that job five days, you know, in in the, the setting. Um, and it's definitely the first question we get. But, it you know, is. But I mean, it's an operations job. So there's operations like you're going to be dealing with other people. You have to be there. You know, there's a lot right. of things that go on on a day to day basis that are going to go wrong. If you're operations, you have to troubleshoot and be on site. Right. Right. Well, it's such an interesting aspect to me that somebody would say that right out the gate, because think about, you know, like five years ago, <laughs> no one would have. No ever one said said it. It. <laughs> I mean, they might have like kind of thought, wow, if if this was a dream scenario, but just yeah. like out the gate. Oh no. So yeah. hundred percent. It's, it's so common. And at the same time, my recruiters and myself ask, ask that, you know, are you okay with going to an office every day? Are you open to hybrid? You know, we have to ask those questions, you know, it's right. fourth question out of our mouths. Wow. Isn't yeah. that fascinating? You know, I've got to believe too, it, 
it trickles down into all these other areas about, you know, your commute times, how you prep for, you know, eating lunch, what, wh how you dress, yeah. um, the clothes that you need to buy or wear, um, for, you know, your professional engagement or being on a campus or in an office. Um, it has so many implications that are, are pretty radical, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, wow. It's such a struggle, you know, it's, what's the what's going on at that organization you know what's the environment like i i still i have some nonprofits that their work was just remote and off-site so that when COVID happened they closed their office and everybody just stayed remote it doesn't matter because the site locations are at schools so the fundraising could be done from home and then mm -hmm deal with the site locations and the logistics then you know the office aspect doesn't need to be done my staff has been remote since you know, we've always been remote. You know, we have an office space that we utilize for interviewing, but we're pretty much always remote and it's fine. We yeah. deal with this. Um, I can't understand why some organizations say to their staff, you know, why don't you come in this set schedule and then we'll come in the other days, but they're still basically working independently then, you know, <laughs> it should hey. be everyone yeah. at the same time. I like that you said that. I yeah. like that you said that because you're right. It's um, it's not really addressing the team issue mm -hmm. when you have that. Yeah, it's it's more that you're you know who's the person behind the desk at that yeah. any moment versus what's what's the team you know environment looking like. So yeah, I appreciate that you that you said that. It's it's an absolutely fascinating thing and. You know, I got to believe that it's not going to go anywhere. I think it's interesting that you made the comment. Some people want to be in that environment. They, they need the structure or they want a different um, cadre of people around them or, you know, they want to escape from being bound at home or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, I've got to believe the work from home environment is really built its own wave of, of action and activity and that that's not going to go away. Yeah, you're right. And I think that the other thing that I've been saying probably for two years now is the positions that are that they're requiring to come in the office are the lower paying positions. Right. So who needs yeah. to come into the office? The admin assistant, the office manager, the people that are opening the mail, answering the phones, doing sort of the nitty gritty work. But yet their supervisors are remote, um, you know, on a beach or something like that. And they're the people that are making way higher salaries. And I'm not saying, you know, it's right or wrong. You know, I understand the need to have someone in there at the office, opening mail, doing those things. Yeah. While the supervisor is home, you know, what are you doing? Are we teaching um, a, the, the, the greener generation, you know, different ways in the office and how culture should be? And what are we teaching them in terms of what the future would look like? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really uh, I love that you brought that up. Yeah. Because the modeling and the behavior of the workforce is critical. I mean, that that goes across, you know, all generations. And uh, yeah, it, it's a huge, huge thing to be considering. Mm -hmm. Let's when we talk about and again, we're sitting here, it's in the summer, it's hot. We're talking about fall labor, looking at things. How far out do we plan and work and what should we be thinking about? Because if we we factor in this kind of like, ah, we're in a general election status quo, what's going to happen? What are you, how do you advise us to be looking at this? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a unique question because all nonprofits are sort of working independently on their own, um, their own sort of, sort of fiscal year, which I keep yeah. saying, right? So and then there's organizations that have maybe never even hired attempts before. Maybe they've never budgeted it correctly, et cetera. So there's a couple of things to look at in terms of how much notice do you give, need to give a temp agency, whether it be me or another one. You know, a month's notice is always good. Um, sometimes a little bit even before that is great, too, if it's a really hard search. Um, but you should pop, probably plan a month out. Um, okay. If we're talking about the fall, you know, so many things can happen. Um, we're talking about fall galas, right? So if you may need someone to help with an event that you have coming up in the fall, you know, start to think about that now and what does that budget look like? Um, if you have grants that need to be renewed, 
Um, you need to start to look at that. You know, what's that workload going to look like? Are you going to hire a temp for that? Um, how many hours a week are they going to work? How long are they going to or how long are they going to be needed? Um, and then on top of that, you know, year end or, or I should say Christmas gifts or holiday gifts that are coming in, getting all of that data entry to get acknowledge, acknowledgement out before uh, December 31st. So what's that look like? So mm -hmm. it kind of depends on what your organization is doing for fall. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that because it, it also helps you to figure out what are the goals of the organization, right? Like where, where do you need that help as opposed to being just dragging down the rest of your team or not getting the work done? Yeah. Even more importantly, not getting the work done. Yeah. It doesn't make sense for your director of development to be doing acknowledgement letters on December 22nd. You know, you really should hire a temp for that. It doesn't make sense for your director of development to be stuffing envelopes for the gala that are going, you know, if that needs to go out. You know, you need to hire a temp for that and pay them way less. Um, those are kind of the three scenarios that I see most for fall hiring. And then on top of that, you know, is someone going to have a baby? You know, should you plan for that? You know, you probably know that that's going to happen now. So making arrangements for that and budgeting that in now. I love that. I hadn't thought of that, uh, taking that that labor gap in during maternity leave and then filtering that in. I think that's really smart. Absolutely. Well, these are all good ideas, but the reality is, dun, 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 what's the process and what's the cost like how does this work for those the of us on the, in, that are uninitiated like what do we even do and how should we even frame it up to know what the costs and and i like to also talk about the process like mm -hmm. how does that work sure so i will give you an example of our process so essentially you know that you need a temp I always use a database temp as my go-to example. So let's just say your database manager quits. It's literally the only person that knows Razor's Edge in your organization. No one else knows it. You don't know what to do. You give me a call. You tell me that you need someone who knows Razor's Edge because no one else knows it and they need to start <laughs> right away. So essentially what uh, my team and I would do is we would get the specs of the job. So what are the hours? Is it remote? Is it on site? Whatever it might be. How soon can they start? How long do you anticipate this going on? Um, are you going to look for a full-time person on your own or do you wanna treat this as a temp to perm? If this is a temp to perm, what will be the salary range for this person when you decide to bring them on, et cetera? If budget is an issue, I'll talk to them just about a part-time person. You know, can you afford someone 15 to 20 hours a week as opposed to 35 to 40, okay? I will take the specs that the client then gives me and I will go into our labor market of candidates that are available that all have razor's edge. We will identify two to three people with that specific skill set that can also commit to the logistics of the job and are interested in the mission of the organization. We will then send you those resumes in those resumes, you will see the bill rates. So let's just say this is a more junior level person. Oh. Hourly rate will be about 40 an hour. Let's say that this is a true seasoned database administrator. Maybe the rate would be 65 an hour and maybe there would be someone in between, okay? You will be able to see on paper, Joe Smith is 65 an hour and this is why. Jane Doe is 45 an hour and this is why. You can then choose what you wanna do. Do you wanna interview them on the phone? Do you wanna just go on who I recommend and have that person start? So essentially what will happen is you choose how you wanna proceed with the candidates. Typically my clients who work with me all the time will just go by rec my recommendation. If you're new to me, you might wanna interview them and that's fine as well. The person will start working for you and be my employee. So essentially they will send a timesheet to me each week that the organization signs off on, the supervisor signs off on, we will pay them and then bill you within 10 days. So in that 45 an hour, if you went with Jane Doe, we are paying her. It includes our unemployment, payroll costs and insurance, basically the full burden of the employee. So that person will stay on my payroll for that duration and we can get them up and running super quickly. A lot of these larger organizations, foundations, hospitals, education organizations, sometimes they have to do their own background check, their own HR process. It could take four weeks for them to get someone in the door. And as we said, it's an immediate need, right? So that's the 
the advantage of going with a temp agency because I can background check them. I can reference check them. I could do all those things within basically 72 hours and have that person starting immediately. I could have someone start within 24 hours if we needed to. So it kind of depends on where your organization is at and what HR says. But essentially, that's how it works. Um, the person can work for you for two to three months. You love them. You decide to take them perm. At that point, you would then pay myself or the agency attempt a perm conversion fee, whatever that calculates out to. And then that person is free. I shouldn't say free. You take them onto your payroll and then you pay me a finder's fee. And essentially, we're done. Or you can have found someone on your own made that higher, we transitioned the temp out. Now that temp is unemployed, I can either get that person out working or then they go on to my unemployment insurance and stay on that until they get work again. But they're not gonna sit on your unemployment. They're sitting on mine. I've taken on the burden of the employee. Wow, this is riveting because it is so robust and it's it's so, um, I almost wanna say you're handling the icky parts mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of labor um, so I got to ask, what if you bring somebody in and they're not a good fit and, um, you're like, holy moly, this just isn't, this isn't working for us. Fire this them right away. away. Okay. But you, but the staffing agency. Fire does them. Yeah. yeah. No questions asked. I always say just, if you're not happy with a temp where they're bringing you like a headache or it's, it's not mm -hmm. easy, get rid of them. Let we'll find you someone else. So many, of my, so many of my clients are so nice. They always want to give someone a second chance. Yeah. I'm just like, let's just get you a new person. You know, I don't, I don't want you to have any sort of aggravation. This is supposed to be easing your headache. And if it doesn't, let's just replace the person. You know, I think you've kind of struck on something that's part of one of the problems that we have in the nonprofit sector. And that is that we tend to be more empathetic and we tend to be you know, um, I don't want to say look the other way, but we try to manage people in the situations um, when they're less than or the, mm -hmm. the situation is less than versus in the for profit world uh, where things are done a little bit more quickly. And, and yeah, empathy. And, and I think that, you know, it is definitely case by case. If someone has been with you for a few months and, you know, it's something that can be worked on. Yeah. Like, yeah. let's just kind of have a talk with the candidate and and yeah. see where it goes. But, you know, if it's in within a week or a couple of days and you know that the person isn't right or they're making errors or something like that, let's just get you yeah. something else. Yeah, I love it. Well, mm -hmm. this has been riveting. And, and I, I love that you would Katie Warnick share with us not only what the, the current ecosystem is so that we can understand what the marketplace is, but then to also understand how we could engage with labor in a different, I think, very intelligent way that would help us with, you know, a short term moving into long term, possibly, as you yeah. said, you know, moving in from temporary to permanent. Um, I think it's been really, really a great conversation. Yeah. And I will so, say this, um, you know, whenever we have, because again, we do lower level jobs, it's assistants, it's associates, it's sort of that mid-level manager. So anytime we make a placement that the client has said to us, it's only temp, it's only temp, I would say, I don't know, eight out of 10 times, they take that candidate on permanent because they like them, they fit in with the organization, they basically already screened them, you know, and then if they don't stay in that position that we place them in, they move to another department, you know, because again, it's what I always say, the nonprofit sector is about the fit, you know, if you like the mission, and then you like the people, there's no reason to not take the person. That's fascinating, because I would not have thought of that. I mean, I wouldn't have thought that that number was that high. But huge. you know, yeah, it's we, huge. <laughs> I love it. Well, I think also in, in the, the staffing uh, arena um, that you mentioned, it is a it's an amazing opportunity to do a test run to see how things are going to work. And, and a lot of times we look at labor and we're like, oh, my God, this is just a burden of, of cost versus realizing this is an opportunity. Yeah. Right. And I will, and I will also say this, you know, so many times have I spoken to clients and then say, Oh, well, we're a nonprofit. We can't afford you. Right. And then I'm like, okay, good luck. Go recruit on your own. And then they call me back in three months. And so they've already kind of figured out like, Oh gosh, like this is the labor market. These are the resumes I'm getting, you know, like these resumes are nothing like what I need. And then they come to me, I send them a person that's like a slam dunk. And then they're like, Oh goodness. Like we're not doing another post. Like let's just take this person, you know? The grass isn't greener. Yeah. <laughs> so that yeah. always happens. Like that situation always happens. Well, you know, it goes back to the way we started the conversation. And, and that is we don't, as a society, really understand enough about the nonprofit sector. 
and what it takes and how it operates and, and all that. So, I mean, it kind of is reflective of that, just your example. And so Katie Warnick, CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique, staffingboutique.org. You can learn more about Katie on her amazing website. There's some really cool images of her that I just love, but uh, you can talk, you can learn about her team and some of the things that we've spoken about today. So Katie Warnick, thank you so much for being with us today. Again, we have amazing sponsors that are with us day in and day out. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, where Katie joined us from, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. This has been great. I, I, yeah, I always learn so much from you, and I'm really appreciative that you take the time to communicate with us and, and help us along because what you do and, and the, the work that you are engaged in is really um, higher level strategy. And so I appreciate you taking us through it so that we can understand how it works and how it can work for our organization. So thank you so much. And we look forward to having you back on another episode of the nonprofit show. Very Talk soon. To you soon. All right. Hey, everybody, as we end each episode of The Nonprofit Show, we want to remind you, we want to remind ourselves to stay well so you can do well.